This guy had just finished making love with a girl. I'm sorry, he said. If I'd known you were a virgin, I'd have taken more time. But honey, she says, if I'd known you had more time, I would have taken my panties off. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Roberto. Oh, shit. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's start started that. Let's start that again. <laughs> sure, sure. One, two, three, go. Go. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah, I was just zoning. My Gioia has a first name. It's G R A N D I. That doesn't work. You, you know, Gioia is how everyone pronounces Jalo until they hear somebody else say it. <laughs> That's like how I used to say creamy. I just kept reading the word creamy, and then finally I was like, man, this word sounds like shit. And Leanna's like, I think it's creamy. And I'm like, oh, thank God. But Brad yeah. and I, privately, we still call it creamies. Well, Germans are the creamiest. <laughs> anyway, hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. Folks, I am joined by a... Mostly nude, but tastefully so. Jeffrey. Hello, Jeffrey. Uh, you may refer to me as Sabrina. <laughs> mm. uh, you can call me Flora, because I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a meanie. You can call me um, Cappuccino, which I think is her name. <laughs> Jeffrey Cappuccino. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Folks, if it isn't completely not totally obvious to you, we are talking about the one, the only, Lambava. The Molam Baba, Mobeda. AKA Lamberto Bava's Delirium, colon, photos of Gioia's, colon, from 1987. Photos of Gioia's, colon, eyeball, <laughs> colon. <laughs> Behead. Mo. 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 Folks, this is a freaking listener request from our good pal, Mark. Thank you, Mark, for contributing to the show. Uh, Jeffrey and I had actually wrapped up talking about every film ever. Yeah, so we're, little, we're, done. we're done. We didn't know this one was a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Neither did Sit Serena Grant. <laughs> yeah, not, not, I don't think there are some people on the, on the side of this film who are unconvinced. <laughs> They're going to find out, though. So yeah, 1987 was a very interesting time for Italian horror. You basically had three directors making stuff that were like making money and getting overseas sales like, uh, you know, like Demons and um, Opera and Creepers, aka Phenomena. Uh, you had some other stuff like that, but then you had like the down, down, uh, what's the thing for, what's the word for an avalanche? An avalanche of, of, of badness <laughs> for the Giallo. The Giallo had hit a little bit of a uh, saturation point, oh, about 12 years before this movie came out. Yeah, you might say the, uh, the Giallo <laughs> fell down an escalator. <laughs> the Giallo got a behead. So, like, I love this, this like, last little gasp of the, the 
I, I'm not even going to say classic era. Of, I just love this era of Giallo. <laughs> it is an an era, yes. <laughs> they tend to be a little overly sleazy. Some of them are just straight up pornos. Mm-hmm. Um, this this one is not one of the pornos, but it <laughs> it has a person who was in a porno or two, maybe more. But uh, yeah, it's just this is just something that happened. I mean, the thing that sets them apart more than anything is, of course, the late 80s aesthetic. I mean, it's so radically oh different from what you see in the early 70s productions. Um, and I feel like it's even distinct from what you saw earlier in the decade. Like, you know, just looking at uh, Lamberto's filmography again, like A Blade in the Dark has a totally different vibe than this, Big time. Uh, <laughs> which is just a, a handful of years later. Um this is a weird position in Bava's filmography. It's kind of like mm-hmm. the last. Well, I haven't seen Demons 3 the Ogre yet. Oh, but boy, it, that's real bad. But I love it. Yeah, it feels like kind of a a last hurrah, though. he. It's not like he stopped working. No, I mean, no. you know, we've got Body Puzzle, which is like this, but even more <laughs> so later on. But but like a little, you know, not as garish as this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, 90s and new, a new decade. Things have changed. Yes. Um, but then also, like, we did, we covered Demons 5, of course, uh, The Mask of Satan on this podcast. That one's crazy, too. Um, but this one, I think it's, it's kind of like, it's a, it's a pinnacle. It's coming right on the, hot on the heels of Demons 2. And it's just a lot of excess, a yeah. lot of ogling. <laughs> Uh, with with like our big singular round eye, we are ogling this trashy yes. joy, joy. Mm-hmm. So eighty seven, right? Like you said, right after Demons Two, which you know that was another moderate success for him. Um, he did three things that I can tell. He did this, and he worked on. A, ser- a series called Turno di Notte. Uh, well, I, I can't find any episodes. I found one, but I don't think he directed it. Um, and then he worked on the the Brevido, excuse me, no, that's right, Brevido Giallo movies. He did four films from 87 to 89, including uh, Graveyard Disturbance, which I still haven't seen, uh, Until Death, which I have seen, and uh, the ogre, which of course Demons Three, the ogre, which is something I adore, and he did something called Dinner with a Vampire, which I, I'm not real big on the comedies with Italy, so I've been kind of putting it off. Although I think it's George Hilton, wow, is a vampire. These sound great. I mean, uh, oh, it's yep, yeah, George Hilton. And these are, I mean, these are full length films too. Yes, so it's a little oh, confusing because uh, they they say TV, but they're definitely went yeah. straight to video or some shit. I gotta check these out. Were the ones you saw good? Yeah, they're they're definitely. Uh, I just I need to see Graveyard Disturbance. I keep forgetting to watch it. Ogre Demon Street Ogre is I don't defend it because it's real silly, but it feels like them poking fun at House by the Cemetery. Mm-hmm. and making fun of Fulci specifically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's also, they make fun of Dario Argento in it. And it's just, it's, it's just a little dull, but otherwise I adore it because it's totally stupid. Yeah. You know, I just you know. want to like take a day and watch all of these Bravido yeah. shallows. Ooh. Is the, is the ogre the same as Demons 3, the ogre? Yeah, or is it's it... the same thing. Okay. Yeah. I, it just has two entries because of its, titling yeah, gotcha yeah. And, and like how it was released gotcha okay mm, boy. <clears throat> so i couldn't find a proper trailer for this thing um so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna drop the opening music oh yeah because if folks at home if you haven't seen this yet by the way we're gonna spoil it it's a giallo so all the plot's gonna be ruined this opening music is the greatest thing ever if this doesn't get you hyped for something then you have nothing One, the only Simon Boswell, the oh Boz. The Boz, dude, he's my Boz. I want to freaking 
collect my paychecks from him. I love the boss. He's so good that I bought the um, the Stage Fright soundtrack on yes. vinyl recently, and I listened to it, and it was so good that I wasn't even mad that the sort of iconic saxophone theme from the beginning <gasps> is not on it, which oh is God. weird. Apparently, I, weird. I think I tried to do a little research. I think that one was like a collaboration between him and some other people. So I think maybe that's why it was left off. Maybe like rights issues, but it, it was so good. It didn't even really, well, it still hurt a little bit, but not that much. The boss is great. <laughs> Love that boss. I was thinking this was a film mirage because of the presence of George Eastman. Uh, but no, <laughs> this is not, you know, there's no Joe D'Amato, excuse me, Joe D'Amato. So there's no uh, George Eastman. I'm oh, fuck. Messed that up. <laughs> there, <laughs> hello. There is George Eastman, but there's no Joe D'Amato. So we don't get the, the, a film that's just a mirage of a film. No. Instead, it's a Medusa yeah. film, which is weird because you'd think it'd be a Cyclops film. <laughs> Some other mythical being. Yeah. It's freaking great. <laughs> um, the... Plot synopsis I'm going to read to you is uh, I did something special. I didn't want to just, you know, do the normal thing. So I found the Spanish VHS tape mm -hmm. and then I translated it <laughs> into English. Nice. And uh, here is what it says on the back. Thank you, Google, for helping this happen. Um, they are now our sponsor. So cue the Google bucks and the Google uh, Bitcoin. Pussycat is one of the magazine's erotic bestsellers of moment. Its owner and director receives continuous and Flora's unpleasant pleasure, excuse me, ooh, unpleasant pressures to sell the business. At the same time, a series of terrible murders of Joss Magazine and People Models A backslash legacies to N comma Isma comma, whose culmination is reception by couple of the director of a photo of each of the corpses before a poster of it. Growing intrigue creates situations of great tension leading to the most classic terror from the hand of that great genre master who is Lamberto Bava, with a little, uh, <laughs> an extra uh, accent on the A there. One more incentive of this film is contemplate Sabrina as one of the models posing for Pussycat, and it will have the tragic end than her companions. <laughs> That's it? That's it. Um, so I would say that that is actually probably one of the more accurate synopses that we've uh, ever encountered on the back of a, a slab of plastic. Yeah, why isn't that on IMDb? Come on. Yeah, right. Well, you can what update I, it. What I should have done is translated it into Japanese from the Spanish and then into English. And then no. just keep going. Yeah, I think, I think it's fine. I think you did it. All right, I'm going to close that Google search. I won't do it right now while you're waiting. <laughs> <clears throat> what you need to know about this film is that we get nudity in the first second of the film. <laughs> Serena Grandi uh, of uh, Anthropophagus and um, of the political party that uh, Mussolini's like granddaughter started. What? Yeah, she she had some strange political leanings. It was so oh, weird. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, she was in, she was in Anthropophagus. She was definitely very different in that film. She had, she was a mom. So they had her very, um, mom-like, of course, because of her measurements, because Serena Grandi is a very uh, voluptuous actress, almost mind-bogglingly so. Of course, she was in a Tinto Brass movie, maybe multiple Tinto Brass movies. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I keep getting offers to review Tinto Brass movies, and I say, Haha, no thanks. Listen, I only got so much time for butts. <laughs> butts and big old boobies. Hooray. Was his new movie like P.O. Box Tinto Brass or something? <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> he just gives you his P.O. box number. It just It's just flashed on screen next that, to a butt for an hour and 30 minutes. No, I would, two I, hours and 30 minutes. I would actually think the post office has to regularly fumigate P.O. box Tinto Brass's freaking P.O. box. <laughs> um, she's also in um, uh, Luigi Coetzee's uh, The Adventures of Hercules. <gasps> with Lou for right now. Oh yeah. my god. I, you know, I knew there was another reason to watch that. I just still haven't gotten around to it. Yeah, she's pretty low build, but um I've heard I, that movie's crazy. Yeah, they're pretty nuts. 
Um, but in this movie, she plays uh, uh, freaking Gioia, but I'm going to call her Gloria because of the English dub, yeah. which is magnificent, by the way. Yes. Um, she's Gloria, so we're going to call her Gloria for this. I might um, alternate. We'll see. <laughs> hey, we got to mix it up. Um, we're at a photo shoot with uh, David Brandon, who plays uh, an, a photographer named Roberto, our, our dare I say, red fish herring man of the movie i love david brandon so much he was in freaking stage fright we played the jerky yes uh director um he was also in you may um, recognize him as second unit director of 102 dalmatians really he was actually a director in real life uh, second, second unit second director unit, but still hey that's <laughs> Hey, Man, that's, that's too that's cool. Something. That's something. Good for him. No, I just love his voice. I, like, I think he actually is. He's not um, Italian. He's he's uh, British. Oh, really? Because I believe that's his real voice in yeah. Stage Fright, and that is his real name. Mm. So, okay, David Brandon. I like him. I like him. English. Uh, so he's he's doing a photo shoot, and he's you know given directions. Uh, meanwhile, oh we my have... god, his directions are so good, though. <laughs> um, all right, I've got. I wrote some of them down. Like I was just. Yes, please. I feel like I wrote a lot of dialogue down and left it unattributed, but I feel like much of it comes from uh, Roberto. Uh, here's here's what I managed to get down. I think this is all verbatim. I may have embellished. Uh, let's see. Caress her, girls. Act like you love it and laugh. Keep laughing, all of you. Remember, you want to be possessed. Make it sexier. <laughs> Surrender to pleasure. <laughs> that sounds like all brandon to me <laughs> yeah i couldn't write dialogue that good mm, i think you could you just mm. need to workshop it with a friend all right uh we get to see uh another guy helping out he's a splasher his name is tony and he's played by someone named vani corbellini and uh tony is the younger brother of our main character uh Gloria. Um, I, um, I, um, I, um, I. This guy acted a lot. He had 55 credits. I do not recognize anything. It's like, if you weren't in Argento's films, bro, I don't recognize you, okay? Who are you? Um, he, is, he has the most unfortunate perm of the movie. <laughs> uh, but he, he's just splashing water on the models and, and like encouraging them to be sexy, too. Is it him or is it Roberto who has the unfortunate um, waiters on in this scene? That's Roberto, some... I believe. Roberto, okay. Yeah. Yes. He doesn't want to get wet. He doesn't want to get wet. <laughs> that's in his, that's in his freaking contract with the film is like, I can't get my legs wet. <laughs> no. Can't get my legs they wet. Would, they would shrink and wither if they did. Oh, actually, <laughs> um, I, oh, 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 I, I got to point this out. Uh, whoa, whoa. Uh, the, the actor who plays Tony is, is in some movies that are very important to me. Oh, tell um, me more. Some films by the uh, director. Peter Greenaway. Uh, he's in The Belly of an Architect in the same year as Delirium <gasps> um, with Brian Dennehy. And oh, then shit. in the next year, he's in another uh, Drowning by Numbers, which is another really fantastic Peter Greenaway movie. Now that one I've heard of. Yeah. They're both all. I mean, every Peter Greenaway movie is awesome, um, but these ones are particularly awesome. Check right, them now, out. Now he's, he's the vegetarian director. Peter Greenaway? Yeah, because of his name, he doesn't eat meat. Uh, uh, well, his actors eat eat each other sometimes. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of murder and mayhem, a lot of blood. Oh, I'll look into them. I I do not know his filmography at all. Oh, my God, they're amazing. Yeah, he's a, he's a very um, stagey art film director and that all of his uh, uh, compositions, both uh, they look like paintings, but they sort of play out in a sort of static framed way, like, like you're watching something on stage, just immaculately detailed, very strange. Um, I think you dig him, honestly. I, that sounds familiar. Did he do that one with, uh, Nicole Kidman? Uh, I don't believe so. No. Um, I mean, no. his most famous is, um, uh, the cook, the thief, his wife and her lover. Oh, that guy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's pretty representative of his work. I was thinking of Dogtown. 
Oh no, that's no. Dogville. <laughs> no, that's Lars von Trier. <laughs> dogs, dogs are us. Dogs are. We bought a dog. Hey, Lars von Trier. He's cool, right? Oh no. <laughs> well, well, well known cool fucking, guy. Well known cool. sweetheart, <laughs> Lars von Trier. Well, uh, he's actually his uh, his new credit is just Dick Bagel. So, <laughs> meanwhile, this whole fashion shoot's going on. We got Mark the Peeper. We got a, a wheelchair-bound gentleman named Mark, uh, who's played who's by played? Carl who's... Zinni. Oh, I really thought it was Richard Ramirez. <laughs> <laughs> no, this guy bathes. No. I, I, I guess so. His hair looks very fluffy. Richard Just Ramirez. Like Richard man. Ramirez. <laughs> That's that's the biggest takeaway I got from reading about him was that he smelled really bad because <laughs> he was not f- a fan of bathing. Yeah, yeah. Loved crack cocaine though. <laughs> so, um, Carl Zinni is uh, from Good Old Demons. Yeah. Um, and that's the one I I always thought he was in. Um, oh, he's also in Graveyard Disturbance. But I oh. thought we saw him in uh, the Mask of Satan, the the one, the Demons Five we talked about. But mm-hmm. he's not in that. I just kept thinking mm-hmm. he was weird. He's hilarious in this. He should be in all movies. Oh yeah, he's good. He um, he's creepy as shit. Yeah. Yes. So he's peeping with a, a telescope, but he's not looking at the models. <laughs> he has got his eyes on Serena Grandi, Gloria here. Um, the thing about. Uh, th- this photo shoot is they're recreating famous pictures that uh, Gloria did in her heyday when she was a Playboy style model, which she seems very ashamed of. Right? Doesn't she like? Aren't the photos like they're they're like hidden now? Nobody yeah, they're has like access locked, they're to like them. They're like locked down. <laughs> yeah, which is weird. Like, how did yes. she get famous off of this thing that now nobody has access to? I don't know. Oh, um. Weird. We we see her sitting by the pool uh, at a safe distance so she's not getting splashed. Uh, she's sitting there talking to her pal Evelyn, played by Daria Nicolodi, mm-hmm. who is still in that period of the 80s where she should have fired her stylist. <laughs> she's not as bad as she looks in uh, in freaking Paganini Horror, but uh, <sighs> she's she just, man, she just needed to fire her stylist, whoever was dressing her and doing her hair. I mean, here's the, like, you know, if you're looking for a Daria Nicolodi uh, joint, this is not it, unfortunately. No, no, this no. is This is in her in the mode of, like, I'm here and I'm gone. Bye. Yes. Which, Which is like, funny. at least in Paganini, she's in it, you know. Yeah, she's more. actually a character. Yeah. In this, she's one of the, she's one of the many red herrings. Mm. What I like about this, though, is it reminds me of how, let's just use a nice word, we'll say frumpy. In uh, in freaking Argento's opera, because uh, he wanted her to look as terrible as possible on film, <laughs> which one of the trivia pieces about this film is that uh, Dario Argento was supposed to direct this, oh, but uh, after some script changes, he bailed and uh, let good old Lambaba do it. The more Lambaba, more better. God, you know what? In 87, I kind of... I don't know. Did 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 Bava do this better than than Argento would have? Um, I think as far as um, it would. They're just so different. It would be I so know. different. I would not trade this movie for anything. But I mm. I would love to be in the uh, the other timeline to see uh. Argento's vision for this freaking uh. movie. <laughs> it would definitely be his most sexual film. Like weird. <laughs> Yeah, but he's like weird about sex stuff, so it would probably be just like more hateful about it'd be sexuality. More women, yeah, it'd be more women's heads going through glass yeah. windows. So Mark Mark calls and uh, he's really obscene. <laughs> he says some horrible shit to um, uh, Gloria, and she just puts up with it because I would she actually pities say, him. I would say that he says like weird, pathetic stuff. Uh, yeah, like, like he's like. If I told you I was playing with something, would you come help me? And I think he means his telescope, which, I mean, he seems like he's handling it fine. Um, but he also has this this absolutely baffling line where he says, please put out my fire. That's like the opposite of what you want 
when you're like, you know, you're you're a uh, you're a little randy. Hey, you you, you wanna want to flame the fire. <laughs> you want a burning sensation in a relationship. Listen, please, please smolder my embers. <laughs> oh, baby. <laughs> That's how uh, Jeffrey auditioned for the podcast with that very line reading just now. Yeah. Let me help you. Gloria. Oh, hello, Mark. I'm watching you. You are? Yes, and I'm going crazy. <laughs> if I told you I was playing with it, would you come over and help me? <laughs> no, don't be angry. It's not true. Don't hang up. I just have to tell you how beautiful you are today. More than usual. Are you wearing your panties now? No, don't put down your skirt. You don't know how much pleasure I get just watching you. Don't you want to let me see you in the nude? I'd be forever grateful. Listen, Mark. You've been watching a show right under your window that isn't so bad. Be happy with that, huh? You're not like those others, Gloria. You could put out my fire, all right. You're a sex goddess. You make my member throb with desire. He wants to penetrate your flower and explode. This is getting boring, Mark. And you're not very funny. We cut to a scene of dinner time. Uh, Re- uh, Evelyn has made food for everybody, and it's uh, Roberto, Tony, um, Evelyn, and uh, this model. I believe the model's name is... Is this Kim? This is Kim, the model. And uh, Tony... Okay, first of all, this <laughs> joke... <laughs> when you come in the middle of a joke, Roberto's telling this hideous joke that doesn't make a lick of sense. So so we don't hear the entirety of the joke. Right. Okay. Because I felt like I had zoned out and just <laughs> missed the beginning. So I just wrote down the dialogue from the end of it and then the response to it, and it was baffling. Yes. <laughs> uh, but we, we get this terrible joke. I'll play the audio so you can hear this awesome punchline. And then immediately, freaking Tony is really catty about. There's a lot of catty freaking characters in this movie, but Tony is. They compliment Evelyn on her cooking, and then Tony's like, "Well, everything Evelyn does is perfect." <laughs> and everyone just stops and is like really quiet, like they're really ashamed of how fucking stupid he is. Oh my god! But the only thing scary so far in the movie is the decor in Gloria's friggin' house. <laughs> what? This, like, I actually wrote, and I would never write this now, in my review for this frickin' movie, I wrote that it was dated. Like, I actually wrote, like, I would never even say that now because it's such a, like, this movie's really dated. Of course it was dated. It's frickin' 30 years old, goofball. But, like, I, I couldn't resist saying it because of the fashions and because of the, this horrible decor and the hair and the music. It's pleasantly dated because it literally came out and it came out on a date. So technically all films are dated. I mean, I would describe all of the furniture in our home as furniture designed to kill you if you like <laughs> stub your toe on it. <laughs> This was like my parents' house. My parents bought a house. They were very excited to buy a, a really nice house in Palm Beach, of all places. And uh, they bought the model house. <laughs> oh, so man. pre-furniture. We got rid of all of our cool old 70s oh, furniture and got the model house in, God, this might have been 88 or 89. So the entirety of our house was like four colors. White, <laughs> seafoam green, gold, <laughs> silver, oh. mauve. So it's like five colors. And it was horrifying. The whole house, every, everything was gold or freaking mauve. Dude, oh boy. it looked like Ivanka Trump exploded. Not Ivanka. Damn it, I made the wrong reference. Ivana. What was his, what was his ex-wife? The one from the 80s? Um, Ivana Trump. Was that right? Ivana? Yeah. Oh, damn That's it. why she's I want to get this. Yeah. It ain't Marla Maple's house. No, Ivana. The good old days. Kim, the model, and uh, freaking Gloria are hanging out, and they're talking about uh, Carla, Carlo, excuse me, Carlo. Uh, <laughs> uh, I changed genders for him. Uh, that's the, the dead husband of Gloria, and he died in a horrible accident because he had to prove that he could go 200, and, uh, 200 kilometers <laughs> per hour for some reason. Yeah, he was overcompensating for something. Dude, I mean... I would want to show off for Serena Grandy. I would be like, yo, look, I'm a podcaster, bro. And she'd be like, 
Yo, cool. look, I could drive this podcast at 200 miles an hour. <laughs> Just need more coffee. And then I crash and burn. <laughs> uh, but while they're talking, they put on some badass music on the stereo. And they're just chilling, and uh, all of a sudden, outside, the lights start going funny colors. And we get something very exciting to yours truly, and it's becoming a theme on this show lately, a swimming pool at night. Mm. Man, mm. I just love swimming pool at night. I don't know what it is about that. It's like like something comforting in the movie. I just really love it. I mean, personally, I don't, just because, I mean, since... Since we last watched it, I'm just afraid that if I go too near a pool at night, <laughs> Stefania Stella is going to pop out and, I don't know, sing at me, I guess. I hope she does. She'll serenade you. <laughs> uh, we, we get some rock music. Simon Boswell uh, steps on the, the rock setting on his freaking synthesizer. And uh, then we see um, Kim, who's going home. She's, she's walking to her car, walking by the pool. We see that she's transmogrified into Eyeball Head. Eyeball Head. Classic Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles villain, Eyeball Head. Yep. Man, this this is like the scene in the movie. This is how Lamberto Bava, I didn't watch enough of the interview, but I did get the idea that he was really bored with working with the giallo in, in the giallo genre. So he wanted to do something weird. So he tried to mix things up by having these crazy makeup effects. One of them being this freaking eyeball head. I mean, I think this is really the one, like it's an entire mood because you're right. It's around a night pool, which is like the most atmospheric thing you can imagine in the eighties. So there <laughs> she is. Psych clop, clop, clopping around the pool, smoking out her eye slit. Yes. And then she gets pitchforked. And you know what? It's finally at that point that she lived up to her promise and started making waves when she <laughs> fell into the pool as a corpse. I want to take one of the pop songs from uh, from frickin' uh, Manhunter mm-hmm. and just kind of take all the shots of her <sighs> with the eyeball head just walking around the pool and just run them on a loop for that entirety of those crazy pop songs that are just so freaking prominent in manhunter and just intercut it with that that iconic shot of will graham just on the beach staring straight ahead and yes. close up yes yeah. perfect it's so cool so yeah she gets forked and uh I, you're making waves that was great mine forked that was that was too easy so mark witnesses this murder uh, or did he and he calls uh gloria to report the murder and she of course is skeptical but she goes out to check the pool as it's raining and her, her very sheer dress gets completely soaked. And we get one of many peaks of peaks at, excuse me, Serena's grandies. <laughs> like we do on Hello, This is the Doom Show. This is a uh, one entrant night, wet nightgown contest. Yeah. Uh, she wins. And she wins. Yeah. Oh, uh, she gets really mad at him because she doesn't find the body. And dude, she says a line I had to go back for like four times. I believe she screams, sit on you at him. Is that what she says? Like, sit on you. Maybe it's shit on you. It, but it doesn't sound like shit on you. That's the mm. funny thing. Also, he'd probably like that. So that's he's not really kinky. Yeah. He is kinky. Man, I, <sighs> Mark is Mark is great. He does give her an important detail oh, what's that, that the uh, the killer had long blonde hair. Oh, so right away, our Evelyn yes. uh, uh, alarms are sounding. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to piece this together later, folks, because when you finally get a chance to see our killer in their full regalia, I've got some comments on that. It's great. The next day at the office, uh, we meet Flora the shark. Uh, this is at the pussycat office. I think where, this is the uh, first time that Gloria we're told. Gloria runs shit. Yeah, we're told this. I think this is the first time that we're told that this is the that the magazine is called Pussycat. <laughs> yeah, we actually see a copy of it, and we're like, "Oh, brother." <laughs> yeah, we're like, "Oh, oh, we thought that this was like a high fashion thing, but no, this is just like the Italian hustler." Yeah, yeah, mm. exactly. So Flora is played by Cappuccino. Cap- one of those cup amazing, of she's a cup of coffee, one of those awesome one named people. She is mm-hmm. kind of an it girl in the 60s and 70s. I want to say I saw her in, 
something Jean Roland. Did she do a Jean Roland movie? That'd be interesting. Um, I guess. No. Well, she's in Fellini's Satyricon, which is a film I am very fond of. She's in What's New Pussycat. Oh, she's classic. She's in The classic. Pink Panther. Holy shit. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I gotta look this up. I have been mixing her up with someone. Who's the one that climbs out of the clock and freaking shiver of the vampires? Who the heck was that? Oh, that was, I think, Dominique. So another one-named person. One-namer. Mm. Yeah, one-namer. I'm just making movie oh, references. Oh, 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 most important of all, she what? was in a 1985 season one episode of Murder, She Wrote. Episode I've 14. seen that. Yes, I've seen that. Thank directed, you for catching that. Directed by John Llewellyn Moxie, what? who is a great uh, TV director Dude. who did a lot of cool um, horror films for I TV. Love it. He did mm. indeed. Man, thank you. That's great. Wow, that's um, cool. We watch a lot of Murder, She Wrote in this house. <laughs> so, uh, Floro, the, the biatch, uh, she wants to buy a pussycat from uh from gloria and she's being a real dickweed about it and i wrote in my notes meow hiss meow. cat fight well, the only person cattier than tony is flora flora is incredible as this cat lady and this whole exchange i wrote in my notes is amazing someone describes gloria at some point it might be flora as being quote so provincial Oh yes, she she's constantly trying to remind Gloria of her her uh, meager beginnings as a as a like a country bumpkin who became a porn star or like a because it, it is intimated that she was in porn movies <clears throat> and <throat> that she was just posing for all these naughty magazines and stuff yeah. and she met Carlo her two hundred k- k- kilometer per hour husband <laughs> and he basically made her a legit person in the in the eyes of high society but flora is there to remind her Mm-mm, girl you suck and it's fucking brilliant i love it this is in my part of the notes for like this section and i i didn't i didn't actually like note it very well so i'm not sure <laughs> if it comes here or sometime later but it seems like a flora thing to say i'm probably wrong but you never know uh it, but it's such a good quote it's worth it's worth mentioning yes please. Um, someone maybe flora says quote the hate of a woman can be very bad. Yes. Which, you know, that old saying. <laughs> that was that sounds like Flora. That's so Flora. Oh, my God. Uh, we cut to the killer dragging the body of Kim, the model. And the killer poses it in front of a giant uh, pull-down projector screen, except it's a giant print of right. this infamous picture of Gloria they were recreating in the, in the beginning. And they po- poses the corpse, takes a photo... And then uh, it's going to be sending them out, but only to Gloria. This is, um, we have this type of uh, scene recur a couple times in the movie, and it's pretty cool. It's very moody, well edited, lots of like quick cuts. Um, also like a really cool um, soundtrack cue by the Boz in, in the, the sequence. Um, so cool. Yeah, it's nice. Bava got a little bit of style here. A little yeah, bit, a little bit. Uh, I should say, this was based on a story by Luciano Martino, uh, the brother of Sergio Martino, who worked a lot. He's a producer and not as much of a writer. He was definitely a story guy. Hmm. Uh, But the screenplay was written by, co-written by Gianfranco Clerici. I believe I'm butchering that properly. And Danielle Stroppa. Stroppa. He wrote uh, Phantom of Death. Yeah. Um, he wrote the uh, freaking wonderful mm. Devil Fish, Holy moly. which is hilarious. He wrote good old uh, Miami Golem. Jesus. Five yeah. Women for the Killer. Another one we did. Dude. He did the screenplay for Don't Torture a Duckling. What? And the Bloodstained uh, Butterfly. Phew, Holy dude. moly. This, hey, there's some good stuff here. The only thing missing from all Giallo's is long courtroom scenes. <laughs> But, House on the edge of the park. New York Ripper. What? So Murder Danielle oh Danielle Stropa, he also worked a lot. He wrote uh, Voices from Beyond and Wax Mask. Do, 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 do. Zombie Five Killing Birds. Witchery. God, these these guys are just writing our show. I know. Thank you, Res- gentlemen. <laughs> Responsible for a lot. I think Zombie Five Killing Birds was the one with the uh 
It's a generator. Looks like it's been here for <laughs> centuries. Man. In the context of the screenplay, it was meant to be a joke. Voice actor? I mean, well, he had a voice. He was also an actor. When he said it, it was not a joke anymore. That's beautiful. <laughs> anyway, I'm getting excited. So, <laughs> Gloria comes home from the office to find that, that Evelyn has found the photos. They've been delivered, and she is shook. Or as they say uh, in Italy, she's shooken. Uh, shaken, by... not scared, shaken. <laughs> and so they call the cops, and we get... <laughs> The detective. Uh, this is Inspector Corsi, played by Lino Salem or Salome. I'm not sure. Another uh, dude from the Demons movie. He was. Oh, he was Ripper. He was the guy doing cocaine off of that girl's breasts. <laughs> Ripper. He was also the security guard in Demons Two. Oh man, he's very. <laughs> so he really like reformed between Demons films, right? <laughs> yeah, he cleaned up, went to rehab, got a job. Uh, he was also in freaking Sweet House of Horrors as the, the burglar, which is... <laughs> Demonia, uh, Demonia, too. Oh and my. Uh, and uh, maybe most most humorously, The Passion of the Christ as Accuser. <laughs> I think he played Judas. I think you'll find he played Judas. No, uh, they make fun of this detective uh, because he looks like a hood and not a cop. It's really funny. I could not get over that joke. <clears throat> it's funny it's, i'm laughing I, I can hear you so <laughs> he he questions <laughs> he questions evelyn and uh he he questions gloria about these photos and what the, you know their relationship to kim and evelyn just glaring at him giving him the stink eye the whole time and then the next day uh the new a news vendor putting out these uh copies of pussycat featuring the dead kim actually finds her body in the frickin uh dumpster right as he's put out the issues oopsie <laughs> uh he gets interviewed by a freaking tv guy who's like how did you feel he's like oh, i was shocked i was kind of sick but damn her corpse was hot he didn't say that no. uh so the, the gloria and everybody's freaking uh watching the news and being appalled by the, the discovery of Kim's corpse. And Mark calls to congratulate Gloria on her success. <laughs> she gets so pissed off. Hangs up on him. And then right after that, Evan is like, bro, we got to order more copies of this issue, man. <laughs> Come on, Gloria. Exploit the murder, honey. Come on. <laughs> we see Flora. Uh <laughs> Her, her 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 bitchy competitor uh, hanging out with one of her ladies. It might be her secretary. I'm not sure. Flora kind of collects ladies, as we'll find out. And uh, she, the killer does too. <laughs> hey, she's brooding and drinking. And when she when her assistant tries to not bring her another drink, she says, "Ah, my liver is gonna explode anyway." <laughs> wow. I mean, <laughs> same. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey's like mine exploded right now. <laughs> I mean, what what month of quarantine are we on now? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, Tony uh, has a brilliant idea. Uh, he wants to have a photo shoot on a movie set, so or a TV studio set or something. So he and Gloria go on a little uh, freaking uh, uh, field trip, and then they step into a Luigi Cozzi movie. <laughs> a little you get a little cozy, man. When I, as soon as I saw that spaceship, I was like, okay, this has got to be Luigi Cozzi because there's not enough little doodads and little tiny things on this ship to be freaking Antonio Margariti. Because Antonio Margariti, he loved to do all the little details on the things he made. So this was not his work, but I, I could just see freaking Luigi Cozzi getting all up in this. When Joe Spinell stepped out in a cape, oh, I knew it was Luigi oh, Cozzi. I, Man, that is a movie that lived up to all of the hype and exceeded it. Freaking <laughs> Star Crash. Holy shit. This is Love a good it. one. Uh, so while they're hanging out, she agrees to, to shoot, do a, a, a photo shoot here. And Tony gets all excited and runs off to go make the details happen or blah, 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 whatever people do in the movies. She gets scared by some zombies. 
And one of the zombies jokes, hey, she really wants to be scared. She should see you without your makeup. <laughs> and that actually ended their friendship. It was very sad. But more importantly, is she sees an old flame, or rather an old flame sees her. And this is Alex, played by eight foot nine George <laughs> Eastman. Okay, he wasn't really eight foot nine, but he was... No, he's eight foot eleven. Um, <laughs> eight by, I, eight by I fifty. Had, totally forgotten that george eastman was in this movie oh and i think maybe i missed him in the credits so when he popped up on screen i think i screamed you're like yes yeah <laughs> or you're just terrified no he's he's actually <laughs> he's actually six foot six and three quarters so he's a very big boy uh but he and her had an, a relationship and uh, we'll find out that he actually um broke up with her because he was scared of commitment and that's how she ended up meeting carlo <laughs> We'll we'll find out that he can in fact fit in a standard size bathtub. Oh boy, I don't think that was anything standard size about anything <laughs> in that sequence. But we'll talk about that later. They rekindle their flame immediately because this is a giallo. The only thing that would make this more of a giallo is if they were strangers and they hopped into sex this quickly. Uh, but they have a little date, and of course, Mark is peeping on them when she he goes back to her place, and he's very very not into this. He's very angry. <laughs> And I'm going to play the dialogue of them two. Maybe that's what you're laughing about. Um, I'm laughing about him getting his sniper rifle ready to yes! just murder Thank him. you. Thank you. Oh, my God. It's so creepy. Um, but uh, there's a Eastman, sexy... Eastman has a weird line at some point where he, he describes um, Gloria for reasons I, I have no context for as, quote, a very sexy Bo Peep. That's exactly what I was going to say. Okay, yes, sorry. That is the dialogue I'm going to drop in. This is so great about like, whew, and yes. what is the context there? Why is she Bo Peep? Um, because he's the wolf. Oh. I think he's mixing up some stories. Yeah. Um, okay. He's pretty, he's pretty fuzzy. <laughs> Come on, Alex. You've got me on pins and needles. What's the proposition? Huh? Am I supposed to believe that a leopard can change his spots? <laughs> yeah. Why not? Big bad wolf's been changed into a lamb by a very sexy Bo Peep. Oh, Alex. So we're going to cut to a sex scene here. Now, this is one of my favorite sex scenes, and I don't like sex scenes, so... <laughs> this is like the anti-sex scene. Serena Grandy and frickin' George Eastman in a tub full of little bubbles, little bath time play. Yep. Yep. Um... Yep. If you think that this influenced the infamous pool sex scene from Showgirls, <laughs> you'd be half correct. But this is way actually not as harmful and scary and just perturbing as Showgirls is. I mean, I this would is, say that this one was, is less believable. No, this is hilarious. It doesn't make <laughs> any sense because based on her position, which is face exactly. on her back, <laughs> exactly. legs closed, George, bless his heart, Eastman is humping away at her buttock or th lower thigh. Like, they're practicing safe sex because he's not having sex with her. <laughs> it is an impossible angle. Dude. Un unless he he's just a, an elephant trunk. <laughs> In, like, a very flexible... Like, it, it makes no sense. But they are they are oh going at God. it like they are... I mean, Whoa. the water the water is making waves. <laughs> it's flying, dude. And it's weirdly... So Weirdly, this is the cleanest that George Eastman has ever been in a film. <laughs> Which is funny because when we first see him, he's dressed like this freaking Nordic warrior, like a Hun or something. <laughs> so I mean, good. I love George Eastman, a man who just always looks sweaty. Yes. yes. And even in a bath, he's still like dirty in a way. I, but God, it, I adore yeah. him. <laughs> He's such a such a wonderful man. So um, as they're uh, making the sex act, uh, <laughs> the little bro, Tony, he walks in on him and does the, oh, sorry, and then lingeringly stares at his sister nude and this man. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'll just be over here. Uh, no, go George, on. <laughs> George Eastman has a great line afterwards where he's like, no, don't tell me you're upset your little brother saw you boning and didn't immediately run away. <laughs> yes, I'm upset because he tried to hang out. Oh, boy. Uh, we cut to a photo shoot at the, the studio that they showed us with the pillars and the weird <sighs> lights. It's a beautiful shot. Oh, and uh, we've got this model 
uh, and then a couple other models chained to the pillars, <laughs> and then mummies. We get a bunch of mummies hanging out and ripping this girl's clothes off with more awesome direction from Roberto and Tony. <laughs> ripping them off seems like it's giving the wrong impression like just sort of you know dully fumbling at them until they kind of fall off a little Um, (laughs) oh boy uh, don't forget the smoke don't there's a lot of smoke here too yes the whole point of this scene is to introduce sabrina this model uh played by sabrina salerno who was another uh another sexy lady from from the world of italy Sabrina, you are disgusted and excited by these mummies. Sabrina! <laughs> Dude, uh, she did not do anything after this. She just... Not, you know, in, in, in terms of, like, film, um, like, like movies we'd be into, but she was in a lot of, like, freaking TV stuff and uh, modeling stuff. She's, like, quite a famous person, I think. I don't know. I'm looking at the poster art of a film called Jolly Blue from 1998 and it looks like something i'd be into so i I think it's pronounced i think it's pronounced giallo blue dude giallo blue no it's just jolly no she's she's a very lovely young lady uh after the photo shoot guess what guess what the guess what roberto said when they were done guess what what guess guess what he said what he said that's a wrap (laughs) that's an unwrapped so (laughs) <laughs> Tony, I've I have figured out after watching this movie like six times over the years that the point of this scene is so that Tony can try to hook up with Sabrina. Just imagine this movie without this scene and the whole thing falls apart. Well, Roberto's super judgy, by the way, about Tony trying to hook up with his model. He's like, Meh, doesn't like it. Hmm. It's like, fuck you, Roberto. Tony <laughs> goes back to her place and uh, he can't get it up for Sabrina. And he's really frustrated and it's like, oh, maybe I'm working too hard. And he tries to leave and she won't let him leave. And she says, I never leave a man unhappy. <laughs> How understanding is that's like the most understanding. That's like the most happy sequence I've ever seen in a film where there was erectile dysfunction. Like he doesn't overreact and get violent. She doesn't make fun of him. Uh, I don't look at it as like a reflection on my own problems and start weeping hello i mean i feel what you're saying but then i also say isn't the happiest moment in film the fog mummy scene (laughs) that's true that's true i actually have textile dysfunction textile yeah so that's when that's when you uh use google translate uh poorly (laughs) that's why we started the episode with what we did there's a whole new way it moves today. Places to go, go, people to see. You got to keep, 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 keep up with your feet. You can keep on, keep on moving with Twix. Chocolate caramel satisfaction. Like crispy cookie gets you back in the action. It's nothing two sticks of Twix can't fix. Yeah, Twix keeps your motor humming while you're young, young, young. Keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on moving with Twix. Caramel or peanut butter Twix. Gloria is is calling Yugoslavia because that's where uh, good old George Eastman, aka Alex, is supposed to be filming this movie. And she can't get a hold of him. She's very upset. But then, more importantly than that, the killer, the bees, com- comes after our pal Sabrina with the bees. The killer shows up in a bee costume. I mean, I wish. <laughs> No, a beekeeper's costume. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it would be so cute if it was if you oh look like god. like Jerry Seinfeld B movie. <laughs> You've seen that clip where they every time the trailer says the word B, they speed the movie up by double. <laughs> no. Oh, my god. oh, I might have seen that. Yeah. Or maybe they slow it down by half. I forget. Oh, it's very no. funny. <laughs> the, basically, I remember no details of the joke. You're welcome. I mean, so I didn't, I've only seen this movie once before. Oh, really? This time. Yeah. Mm. So when I saw this again and I saw the killer, I was like, so is that a fencing outfit or a beekeeper outfit? I feel like it could go either way. <laughs> it's a little bulky for fencing. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> I'm so, obviously a fencing expert. As you know. You're yep, a fencing expert. Um, this is called I'm a bee experts. expert. And, yeah, you're, uh, bee, you're a bee And what, what I would tell you is that, yes, um, that many bees could fit into a box of that size. <laughs> that is correct. 
Oh my god. So, so, this is so great. The killer locks the house down and then closes all the, the shutters so she can't open the windows. And then the, he, he, oops, he, oh, who could it be? Is it a woman? Oh, spoilers. Uh, releases the bees and she immediately starts screaming, Not the bees! Not the bees! You bitches! This won't bring back your goddamn honey! You know. <laughs> you um, know. So part of the problem was that she had she had dabbed on some perfume that that I think is like was it like flower scented or something? Yes. But I like to imagine it was just pure honey that she was just rubbing into her yes. skin. And of course, they couldn't afford something akin to that awesome eyeball effect. Yeah. So they gave her this ridiculous bee head to wear yeah. over her head, and it could be a bee or a fly. Or a dragonfly head. It's so cheesy. And yeah. I love it. And then when she starts getting stung, she falls on the ground. She's co- By the way, of course, it goes without saying, she's completely naked in this whole sequence. Uh, it's yes. ridiculous. So <laughs> the killer then decides <laughs> yeah. to add insult to injury, follows her into her bathroom, and pours bee urine or something all over her. Because yeah. it doesn't look like honey. No. But, I mean... Head cannon. We can say it's honey. I just said BP. BP. She puts he he puts the BP all like over her butt and stuff, and then her (laughs) butt gets stung to death. And and then they show these poor bees stuck to her butt, and I'm like, oh no, is this why we have a problem with the environment because of all the bees were killed making this movie? I mean, yeah, this is where the bees disappear to. Yep, they all they it. all went to Italy and then they all died on a butt. Uh, <laughs> on a butt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, my favorite is that when it cuts to this, back to the pussycat offices, where uh, <laughs> they are once again considering the latest issue, which is the uh, the mummy f- photo shoot. So yes. that's on the cover, and it's like the blandest photo possible for the cover, not at atmospheric or moody at all. Nope. And uh, someone is just, uh, you know, one of the like editors is just drawing with like a sharpie question marks next to the mummy's heads <laughs> in close up. It's so funny. It's like, oh, could do they we be want the these killer? mummies? Mm. Oh my god, that is amazing. So killer poses her for the pictures. And then uh, Inspector Corsi is, I think he's on the phone with uh, Gloria, and she's like, the killer is trying to send me a message. And the killer is like, you're not the target. These models are. What are you worried about? Like, Mm -hmm. he totally discounts that the killer is literally placing her in front, uh, behind the dead body. It's so funny. Like That's incidental. Dude, why you worry? We have Evelyn and Gloria discussing who might be the killer. Uh, they begin to suspect Roberto because those photos, those infamous photos of her were supposed to have been lost or destroyed. And they're like, yo, man, you were the one who had the pictures. What's up with that? I thought you had them. And he's like, okay, here's the thing. And hmm. this is the exact line. He says, I had a couple of kids over and I immediately said, Ew, what are you talking about? So I guess Roberto has some questionable tastes, it's intimated, and one of these kids robbed him and stole the photos. So these these uh, precious photos of Gloria could be anywhere. They could be anyone is using them. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go into Roberto's love life. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Doesn't, doesn't sound right. Then Gloria has the dream. The glowing dildo dream with Mark. Mm-hmm. This is the most bonkers thing. I think this is like Lembava's made some sleazy stuff. There's a little movie he made in the 2000s called The Torturer, which I don't know if you've seen any screenshots from. No, thank you. No, thanks. Um, he also has a certain scene where a uh, the killer in You'll Die at Midnight does a certain thing to a woman's nether regions. It's implied but it's horrific Mm. so of course why wouldn't he have mark running around not in a wheelchair menacing gloria with a big glowing dildo object it is insane i mean my favorite part about this is that you know as i've mentioned before mark literally looks like richard ramirez and now here he is (laughs) night stalking breaking in to julia's house (laughs) He missed his opportunity to play that. He's too old now. 
He'll play Rid- he'll play old Richard Ramirez in prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we find out that uh, Mark the next day, uh, Mark is visiting with his doctor, who tells him, "Oh, you know your uh, handicap is uh, is is imagined. It's all in your head. It's psychosomatic." And he's like, "You're telling me I'm crazy?" Because of course he has in a car accident and his uh, fiance died and he's never recovered from it fully. Very important. Wow. Let me tell you, uh, I wrote too many notes. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a good bit of Eastman dialogue from yeah, yeah. he pops into the, the sauna sauna and he says, bum, bum, bum. The only thing warm in here is the sauna. Oh, wah, boy. Wah, wah. He's <laughs> trying to make up with Gloria for not being there when she needed him and not being able to get him on the phone. It's totally ridiculous. I thank you for getting that line. And then uh, Flora and her friend, who's just in lingerie, are watching Gloria's quote-unquote blue movie that she did where she's being uh, stripped of her clothes by a bunch of soldiers. <laughs> Or something, I don't know, it looks, it seems like a Tinto Brass movie, I don't know. Everybody has their kinks. Oh my god. So, Gloria's like, been thinking about this magazine and all the shit that's going on, and she's like, let's sell, let's sell this shit. She's done, she wants to get rid of this magazine. Uh, this is gonna sound so much better after I edit it, bro. Uh, we get the big grave scene where Gloria goes to visit Carlo's grave and very intimidating. This is like the most chilling scene ever. Someone has taken taken a picture of Gloria and taped it to the empty tomb next to Carlo's. Man, that shit freaked me out. I could not sleep after watching that. Mm. Uh, we get lots of crazy music and someone's running through this cemetery, but then it, it's just Mark like wheelchairing real fast and he's there visiting his dead fiance's grave. I think I could have skipped this whole sequence for you guys <laughs> at home. I thought, I thought there was more to it. Uh, so ne- next we cut to Gloria and Tony at the department store. JC and, Pennies. Oh, uh, and they, they act like they are the kinds of fa- rich people who have someone do the shopping for them because Gloria is like, this place is so beautiful. And they meet up with Susan, who works at the store as a friend of Tony, and she's explaining all the floors like this was freaking, uh, are you being served? Like, <laughs> and here's the men's department. What's over there? That's the children's department. Wow, men's clothes are so fashionable <laughs> now. Blah, 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 blah. This department store looks exactly what my my JC Penny looks yes. like today, which yes. is currently on a closeout sale because they're out of business. <laughs> oh, it is so trashy. Like I always remember this sequence as being in a big flashy mall. No, it is totally in a JC Penny's. The only thing they have is like a nice chandelier that really impresses Gloria. Like she is totally freaking like ex- head exploding over this place. It's so cute. Mm-hmm. And her ideas are that she's going to go back to modeling. So <laughs> she's trying to pick out outfits. So she has all these ideas like, what if I wore this ski jacket and nothing else? What if I was on skis and I was completely nude? Or what if I was being modest and put on a scarf? And I'm like, what? <laughs> what is happening? Oh, boy. Then she gets separated from Tony and Susan, and they disappear, and then all of a sudden, a witch flies (laughs) over. I hear you, you witch. (laughs) That was so good. All of a sudden, frickin' Tony's corpse comes rolling on up the escalator, covered in blood. Joy is like, Tony, you should have tied your shoes, I'm always telling you. (laughs) That kid is back on the escalator again. Folks, <laughs> Kevin Smith's Mallrats, you're welcome. You are so welcome. I am a lame-o. So anyway. No, fuck. I got a, I got a Mallrats sidebar. Yes, Mallrats please. is a good movie, right? It's good. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it still. I watched it again recently, wow. um, but I, for the first time, watched the um, the director's cut of it. I did not know there was one. That's the crazy thing. For some reason, it has... The most, honestly, the strangest opening sequence I've ever seen in a film. It's just like five minutes of prologue 
that adds, I mean, I guess it helps explain some things about the movie. It has like a totally different tone. It's so weird. I, I, I feel like this is worth noting, just not in the context of this movie, <laughs> but just generally speaking, because it's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in film. I, uh, <laughs> I think I've seen some deleted scenes. Maybe that was just like stuff Maybe. from the before he made the director's cut. It's so weird. Honestly, this I, I think the director's cut is like only this like opening scene. Oh, okay. As far as I know, it's so weird. It I <laughs> Miramax is not known for like making wise decisions with no. how films should be cut, but I think they made the right choice to escape. Dude, it sounds like it. <laughs> so in this mall, after she finds Tony's corpse, the killer is is taunting her with this high pitched voice. And I don't know about you, but I was waiting for him to start quacking like a duck. <laughs> yeah, he's sucking on that helium. He's oh giggling. You go. <laughs> it's so obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, she freaks out, of course, and she gets on the elevator. Uh, we get lots of gel lighting. We get freaking mannequins. Oh, man. Uh, and we get uh, Gloria <laughs> deciding to arm herself with... It's not really a fire axe. It's more of a fire hatchet. But she's ready to freaking tear shit up. Uh, she finds the corpse of Susan, and then the heavy metal music is going. Mm. And I was like, dude, this is so Argento of this era. He would have had inappropriate heavy metal like in freaking opera there is a mannequin that falls between floors and smashes and for a second i thought it was gloria i thought you know she as so often happens in these films she just turned into mannequin as she fell uh, but but oh. when when she she broke apart her face breaks apart and you recognize that it is in fact a mannequin it looks a lot like the spasmo poster Nice. Yeah, it's cool. Nice Good connection. Call. Reference. Right, yeah. So she gets away. She looks very relieved to be out of there, relieved to leave her brother's corpse behind. And then we cut to the killer. Uh, he has he has the pile of dead folks. He's got Tony. And he's got the Susan character piled on the couch in front of the picture. And then he grabs the bread and butter. Of Lambava's frickin' filmography, he picks up a box cutter. The Mo Lambava, Mo Beta. Folks, if you're under the impression that uh, good old Lambava co-directed and maybe did a lot more directing on uh, Mario Bava's shock, because, you know, Mario Bava was very ill at the time, maybe, maybe Lambava had some say in there because there's a big old frickin' box cutter that mm. flies, flying box cutter in that movie, then you get the box cutter featured prominently in uh, A Blade in the Dark. What is with this guy in box cutters? Um, so he slashes the photo of, of Gioia, or Gloria Gioia, Gioia. And then uh, the next morning, we get uh, uh, Gloria. She's been she's recovering from sedation. And she says my favorite line that's uh, a freaking uh, something gives you hope in these troubled times, folks. She says, I have to go on living. <laughs> and Evelyn's like, do you though? No, <laughs> she doesn't say that. Um, but Evelyn finds more pics in the freaking mail. She finds the pictures of Tony and Susan dead and she takes off in her car. And right when she's about to pull out of the freaking uh, driveway, she finds the corpse of Susan in her car and she screams. And then we have beautiful freaking... Gloria calling Alex to, to ask when he'll be in Rome, and he's such a good freaking sleazoid. Just to add to his red herringness, uh, he's in front of the Colosseum. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh man, Yugoslavia it sucks, right? <laughs> She's probably like, "Why is the connection so good between our two countries?" Uh, Roberto, he finally figures out something. He finds a bunch of these mysterious photos in his uh, studio, and then he finds the pull-down screen with the photos of Gloria, and he freaks out and runs to go tell. And uh, there's a rebel flag in the studio. Did you notice? No. What? On uh, Yes, I swear Why? to God. Why? On the um, the metal stairs, the freaking uh, those um, wind the winding staircase at the top of the stairs. There's just a big old rebel flag. What the <laughs> Stars and stripes, man. 
<laughs> Jesus. Oh, boy. So after he leaves, the cops show up and they find the backdrop. So then they call and get Gloria all freaked out. And so that she doesn't trust Roberto, even though Roberto has some key information here. He shows up. She freaks out. Won't let him come near her. She runs out. He follows her across the street. Boom. He gets hit by a car. The car takes off. Hit and run. And um, so we have now a we great think, line at some point where somebody oh. says, Roberto obviously must have hated women. <laughs> oh, and yeah, he had he had serious issues. Yeah. Yeah. Roberto dies in her arms and we cut to Mark calling Gloria and he asks her, how does it feel to be surrounded by death? And she screams at him. Stop calling, you fool! <laughs> <laughs> Which I love that. After this, we see Mark can walk. He gets up out of the freaking wheelchair and just walks across the room. We're like, oh, Mark's not being truthfulness. Mm. Flora finally gets what she wants. <laughs> Gloria agrees to sell her the pussycat, but she also gives her the claws, Jeffrey. <laughs> so catty she's like it's just like if you weren't such an asshole i would have sold you for your original asking price but because you're a dick now you own it at like way more expensive and floor is like oh touche mm. <laughs> so after she sells the magazine she gets dissed gloria gets dissed and ditched by her best pal evelyn evelyn just leaves her a letter like bye bitch because she's like i work for you i don't work for the magazine goodbye like, wait, I just sold the magazine, you idiot. Mm-hmm. You can still work for me, you fuck. <sighs> so the killer's dead. Everything's happy, except this shit ain't over, y'all. In the it's house. never over. <laughs> no, this movie, according to my notes, it is never over. Never. <laughs> uh, Gloria finds a slashed picture of herself. She's like, oh, no. Then she goes outside and she finds that Tony's a floater in the pool. So Tony's corpse. <laughs> Tony, is what did I tell you about the pools? You gotta <laughs> watch out for the sides. You'll bump your head. <laughs> Get the skimmer. Tony's in the pool again. Put your floaties on. <laughs> oh god. He has that inflatable whale. It's so cute. <laughs> she starts to put the pieces together. She starts remembering all of these important clues. You know, quote unquote important. And then we hear the tape recorder going, or we see. Excuse me. We see the tape recorder going, and we hear that high pitched voice again. And dun dun dun, it's Tony in a blonde wig and Joker makeup. This was his big freaking moment where he was going to audition for uh, what's his name, Tim Burton. Yeah, yeah, he was going to be. He's going to. He's going to beat out Jack Nicholson for the part of the Joker. Oh sure, he yeah. came into the uh, the audition like, hey, I'm the Joker, baby. <laughs> I'm a Joker, baby. So why don't you kill me? <laughs> and then she does. <laughs> this look on Tony is so ridiculous. Like it's just he just looks crazy balls. I kind of like it because he's he's wet from the pool and his makeup's running. But it's like, wait, was that his makeup when he was pretending to be dead, or was that the makeup he was always wearing when he was dressed as the killer? I'm I'm confused. I like it. I mean, it's like in uh, in films and TV shows where sometimes actors wake up with like a full face of makeup and you're like, you didn't sleep in that. <laughs> but he he died in this makeup and woke up like that. That's even less believable. Hey, when he put on that wig, he was asserting himself. He said, baby, I was born this way. What's the matter? Don't you like me? Don't you like me? Oh, no. I haven't become a transvestite. I'm not even very good at that. But why, Tony? But why? You should know, Gloria. You're the only one I love. I've always loved you. Since we were kids. He tells her that he hasn't become a transvestite, which I love. Uh, But then he pulls out a knife and he starts threatening her. And we find out his motivation is that he loves her and he was trying to protect her from all these evil people. But of course, his love is incestuous creepiness because he immediately starts threatening her 
and starts cutting her clothes off because he wants to see her naked one more time, which is what everyone who's watching this movie is saying. Like, we've only seen her naked 58 times in this movie. One more time. And... We gotta celebrate. Oh, boy. It's definitely... This is definitely a joyous noise. When he starts cutting her freaking clothes off, her brazier, and uh, he starts talking about the valley between her rose-capped hills... <laughs> Like, he full-on starts reading out of an old romance novel, dude. It's so terrifying. Ugh. So she's she's calling to Mark. Like, Mark, help me out here, bro. So And, of course, he's not in his normal spot on the window. Because Mark, with that rifle that he showed earlier, he uh, shoots Tony in the dick. Ugh. Which is awesome, because Tony spits up blood. Oh, my God. Because everyone... Like... <laughs> Everyone knows that your your the the dick blood is in your lungs and your well, stomach. It's, so. Listen, if it's not rushing there, it's rushing somewhere. It's got to get out. So yeah, he barfs the blood, and it lingers so long on this this shot of him just like barfing up this blood onto her belly. Uh, it's good. It's real good. Hey, this movie subtle. <laughs> Super subtle, lots of depth, you know, lots of meaning behind it. But as as classy as an issue of Pussycat magazine. Rare. So we look up the hill above above the pool area there, and there's Tony in his wheelchair with the rifle, like yeah, like doing like the almost like he just kicked the goal at it, like a kid's soccer game. He's just so happy that he shot this guy in the dick. Ah, <laughs> uh, so we cut to the hospital. Where uh, Gloria is recovering, we find out that uh, her brother survived, but he may never walk again. <laughs> because as everyone knows, when you get shot in the dick, you can never walk again. Yep. That's what I dicks mean, that's, are for. Uh, they call it the third leg. <laughs> <laughs> How did you make that joke? This is We're topsy-turvy on the Doom Show. Uh, but she immediately has a, a dream sequence, as we've been doing. Uh, where her evil brother is rolling in, looking all pale and ashen, and he's coming to kill her. He's got some roses. He's going to kill her with kindness. But she wakes up, and it's just Mark. Yep, <laughs> just, just the old <laughs> the old Night Stalker. Um, yeah, the other creeper in her life. Right? <laughs> we have a moment where she's just, where he's just like, hey, you don't, you don't go forgetting me now. And then they're just like laughing and it freeze oh. frames with no cat eyes, which is nope. very disappointing. <laughs> uh, but, um, <laughs> you know, a good bon voyage pervert. I won't and, forget you. And I wonder if that's like her signature thing, because he says, don't you go forgetting me. And she kisses her, her index finger and like, Mwah, like waves to him like, la la. And I'm like, dude, that was so weirdly perfect la -la. of a moment. Yeah. I'm like wondering if that was like serena grandy's signature thing when she like signed off or something that's that was that was what she did at the end of her pornos i don't know <laughs> i mean i was expecting her to to walk away from the hospital raise one fist in the air and then freeze yes. frame while simple minds are playing oh my god that would have been beautiful don't 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 so yeah this was shot by uh gian oh my god uh, Gian Lorenzo Battaglia, which is like five or six names. Um, he <laughs> is a cinematographer on uh, good old Demons and Demons 2, Miami Golem, You'll Die at Midnight, Witchery. Don't forget that he is camera and electrical department on Popeye. That's important. Oh, boy. Man, that movie. That's one of my childhood movies that I just <laughs> I have not been brave enough to revisit. Do it. Oh, boy. Uh, he was also camera and electrical equipment boy. He's best camera and electrical equipment man on uh, good old Screamers and uh, a Ruggiero Diodato movie that I would probably never in my right mind watch again called Waves of Lust, mm. which is one of those, hey, let's have like really few characters and like most of them are rapists and it's mm -hmm. a sexy movie. And Richard wonders why he spent $25 on this imported Italian DVD. Uh, <clears throat> mistakes. 
We've all made mistakes. Let's see, what else is exciting about this movie? Um, I watched a tiny bit. I was a bad Doom Show man and just watched a little bit of the interview with Lumberto Bava on the old Media Blasters disc because, of course, I have the Shriek Show disc. Um, I watched a little bit of the interview with him where he was explaining Serena Grandi to the, the people interviewing him and like her career and what she was like and how they tried to write a movie around her to kind of play to her strengths, which is why there's so many sexy parts in it and everything. Mm. And then um, I said, you know what? I'm going to finish this later. And then here we are recording. So I didn't do that. Yep. It happens. Sometimes you don't do your do, do, do diligence. You don't do the doomed. No, I am doomed. That's the problem. Yeah. We talked about all of the beautiful people. The beautiful people. The beautiful people. The beautiful people. people. Jeffrey, how do you like this one? I like this one. It's not a favorite. Um, you know, the fact that I'd only seen it once before now, I think, speaks to that. <laughs> I think that when we originally talked about it, I was like, oh, do I really want to do Delirium? Like, it's okay, right? Um, but then I was thinking about how the f- the fact that we did the other movie called Delirium. That's so right. So we got to do this one, too. Um, I-, I do like this movie. It's got enough of those very idiosyncratic moments um, for me to, to stan it as the kids say. Oh no. Um, we, we actually skipped over one of my favorite moments, oh, uh, which please. is a Roberto moment. It's such a small moment. I mean, it's honestly nothing that one would even note, except I guess I'm not one. <laughs> it's at that dinner scene after the, I would have taken my panties off joke yes. where Roberto gives gloria a gift and it's this little like box that he shakes and then some like shitty like paper plastic flowers pop out of it oh i forgot about that that. just look like absolute shit and then he just hands it to gloria and it's like here you throw this out um (laughs) that's i feel like as as nice a summation of the film that, that i can come up with which is like it's kind of a little box full of shit, but it looks pretty <laughs> and I'll hold it for a little bit before I throw it out. <laughs> oh, so boy. I do like it, but yeah, it's, uh, I feel like it's got all the right components. It just, it gets a little dull in the second half of it where my attention sort of flags, mm. not enough George Eastman, not enough Daria Nicolodi. Just about enough Richard Ramirez, but you know you want to you want to keep that. A, a few more of the uh, sort of surreal makeup effect things could have been good because we only only get the two, right? It's just not. Yeah, enough. they they couldn't afford to keep going with that because I feel like that's the that's the interesting hook that kind of sets it apart. Yeah. Um. So I wish it a little bit more of that, but it's definitely a good one. I like it. How do you feel? Adding to that, I did remember one other thing. Uh, Lambava did say that this was like one of his bigger budgets, which is, sounds insane to me, and that it was one of his more fully realized films from this That's era. Insane. And I'm like, what? So, this is the year after he made. I mean, just two years after he made Demons, so, and then yeah, Demons no. 2. What? I think he was uh, looking back on things with rose-colored glasses. Yeah, weird. <laughs> um. As for me, I love this film. This is not top 10, top 20. Uh, This might not even be top 30 Giallo material for me, but it's just something about it. It has this energy. I don't get bored in that second half. I just think it's just all wonderful. In, here comes the plug, uh, Giallo Meltdown, a movie-thon diary available now. I actually saved this for the last chapter. Every time I was building a playlist for a Giallo movie-thon, I kept putting this one off because it was so important to save this bonkers-ass movie for near the end of the book. And sure enough, it's one of like the last two or last three movies I actually covered. And um, (laughs) I wrote in my notes... Highly recommended for those with cheese in their veins. (laughs) Which I think that was just too personal of a reveal for me. Yeah. And all that uh, easy cheese spill, <laughs> spill, coursing through. 
I love the score, as we talked about. It has that piece of music in it that sounds just like one of those, fil- that film mirage, that piece of music we kept running into over and over and over. I think Simon Boswell just made this piece of music and just said, I don't care what you do with it, or no one even asked him. They just kept reusing it. It's mm-hmm. that atmospheric part. It doesn't have any, like, synthesizer, oh, excuse me, it doesn't have any drums or anything. It's just a, like a real ethereal piece of mystery music, and mm-hmm. we've heard it in, like, a dozen films and if it's not the same piece of music it is somebody copied boswell or what it's so funny yeah it's it's in this movie (laughs) Mm -hmm. i love it uh but yeah dude no thank you to mark uh for requesting this thing and and helping the show out we we hope we hope you still like us i mean you didn't like us before i'm sorry to presume that mark caress us mark Act like you love it. And laugh. Keep laughing. Please. Remember, you <laughs> want to be possessed, Mark. Make it sexier, Mark. Surrender to pleasure. Mark, if you uh, play your cards right, I'll let you see the valley between my rose-capped hills. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, <laughs> you're so provincial. <laughs> hey, I know about the blue movies you did. <laughs> well, you know, I would have taken my panties off. <laughs> it was just like 200 kilometers. We didn't even talk about Flora like being mad that she couldn't seduce Gloria. Like that was a whole thing too. <laughs> oh yeah, see Jeffrey, another couple viewings, at least four more viewings, and you're going to be hooked on this thing. I'm telling. All you. right, give me time. Give me time. <laughs> well, thank you, sir, for being on the show. You're welcome. And folks, good night, and be sure to watch out for your bee heads and your BP. And we're done. Hello, This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is the Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or Go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not enough, go to at doomedmoviethon on Twitter. You can write in to Hello, This is the Doom Show. Use the email doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. Doom Show episodes are available on record and 8-track cassette.